to Planting Considerations for Living Shorelines in Florida. This video covers details relevant to installing a vegetation-based living shoreline in Florida. While this video is designed for marine contractors and consultants, anyone interested in building a living shoreline will benefit from watching this video. Also check out the companion video that covers information about installing oyster reef breakwaters. We will cover several techniques and considerations for both marsh and mangrove plantings, including grade, zonation and species, planting depth and spacing, the timing including the season and tide, and the condition of the plants. First, let's talk about determining the grade and elevation zones for marshes and mangroves. A site survey using benchmark elevation measurements referenced back to tidal data is the ideal way to define grade and slope at your site. The gold standard would be to also perform such a survey at a nearby natural marsh or mangrove site and use the result to develop the planting plan by matching elevations and plant species found at the natural site to your project site elevations. However, if a survey service is not available or is cost prohibitive, you can use other clues to define elevation zones. Natural markers such as rack lines left on a typical day versus rack lines left after storm or king tide events can give a close approximation to the mean high water and mean high high water lines. If possible, you should mark the location of these rack lines or have the property owner do so on several separate occasions since tide levels vary with lunar cycles and wind patterns. Another approach would be to visit the project location during the predicted peak high tide and trace the location of the water line on several separate occasions. Using a good quality handheld GPS to keep track of tide and rack line marks will help with preparing permit required site drawings electronically. Furthermore, you can sometimes look to neighboring shorelines for clues about plant species that are doing well in similar zones. Using these natural clue-based approaches will get you a rough approximation of the appropriate zones to target, but does leave some uncertainty, meaning you may need to monitor plants more closely and budget for plant replacement or swaps after installation. If you find that you have a steep grade at your site, defined as anything above 30 degrees, you should consider softening the slope by regrading the bank to a gentler angle or applying a technique called terracing, whereby the bank is modified so that it steps down more gradually in a series of platforms. The platform edges are reinforced with wood or concrete, and the interiors are planted with appropriate species for the elevation. Once you understand the elevations at your site, it's important to understand how the zonation maps onto those elevations. Let's start with salt marshes. In Florida's coastal salt marshes, there is a very clear zonation of plant communities across the grade from low to high as you move inland from the sea. Elevation is one of the most important controlling factors for plant survival in salt marsh communities. If a salt marsh plant is planted too high or too low in elevation, it will not survive. Therefore, understanding the elevation and grade you have at your site is critical to designing a successful planting plan. There are three major elevation zones we will consider, low marsh, high marsh, and coastal upland zones. The low marsh zone occurs along the seaward edge of the salt marsh. It is flooded daily and exposed during low tide. Exact elevations may vary, but a good general rule is that the low marsh extends from mean sea level at the lowest to the mean high tide line at the highest. Generally, you would only want to install smooth cord grass or Spartina alterniflora in this zone for a marsh-based project. The high marsh zone, sometimes referred to as the mid-marsh, begins just above the mean high water line and extends to the mean high high water line, sometimes also called the mean spring tide line. Plants that live here can tolerate some flooding, although they prefer drier conditions. Species diversity in this marsh zone is higher because conditions are less harsh than the low marsh zone. Species that thrive here include grasses such as black needle rush, salt marsh hay, seashore paspalum, and spike grass, 
as well as shrubs such as Christmas berry, marsh elder, and salt bush. Other species such as the native succulent sea purslane and southern glasswort may recruit along the higher edge naturally as the marsh matures. The coastal upland zone, sometimes referred to as high marsh, includes anything landward of the high marsh zone up to the maritime hammock and is an area that typically would only be flooded during storm surge events. Plants that live in coastal uplands are tolerant of salt spray, but are not tolerant of severe salt stress or water logging. Some examples of plants that thrive in the coastal upland zone are sea oats, dune sunflower, seaside goldenrod, panic grass, sea oxi, blanket flower, and railroad vine. In the high marsh and upland zones, it would be considered a best practice to install more than one species of plant. Adding diversity to a project from the outset can increase success rates and provide higher quality habitat. However, if you can only afford to install one type of plant, most practitioners favor salt marsh hay, Spartina patens, in the high marsh zone, and sea oats in the coastal upland zone. Now let's consider mangroves. Like salt marshes, we tend to observe zonation in Florida's mangrove communities, but it is often not as pronounced. The typical pattern is generally that red mangroves perform best at the water's edge, while black mangroves are the dominant transitional species, and white mangroves and buttonwood trees are found at the highest elevations. That is, red mangroves survive well in the lower and middle intertidal zone and tolerant frequent daily flooding. Black mangroves dominate in upper intertidal areas that are occasionally flooded, and white mangroves occur in patches on higher elevations that are less frequently flooded. Buttonwoods are located just a little bit further inland and are only flooded during storm tides. While elevation is an important factor in the ultimate survival of a mangrove tree, the largest initial barrier to survival and establishment of mangroves is uprooting or toppling due to wave action. This is more of a factor for mangrove transplants because they tend to have more stem and leaf relative to roots when compared to most marsh grass transplants. This creates more drag on the plants and makes them more vulnerable to loss in higher energy sites. When planting red mangroves, target plantings along and just waterward of the mean high water line. Going too much beyond the mean high water line exposes the young trees to more drag and wave action. As they establish, the mangroves will naturally expand waterward to cover their full zone of tolerance, which is similar in elevation to the low marsh zone. In fact, research shows that planting low marsh grass or smooth card grass along with red mangroves increases the success rate because the grasses facilitate the mangroves in many ways. Place black mangrove plantings just landward of red mangroves or interspersed with red mangroves along the mean high water line. Now that we understand elevation and zonation, let's talk a little bit about planting depth. For marsh plants, transplants should be installed so that the root ball is covered completely but is not more than two inches below the soil surface. Planting too shallow will lead to plants being easily uprooted by waves and currents, while planting too deep can expose roots to conditions that are too wet and lead to smothering. A generally good target for most types of transplants, including bare root, is for holes to be between 6 and 8 inches deep. Our marsh transplant research in Cedar Key has shown a hole that is 20 centimeters, or about 7.8 inches deep, provides a high rate of success for grasses planted in both the low and high marsh zones. For mangroves, plant them an inch or two deeper than they are potted. The goal is to ensure that their prop roots or pneumatophores are not entirely buried. Red and black mangroves depend on these root systems to send oxygen into the soil, and if the prop roots or pneumatophores are completely buried, they will be smothered. In higher energy sites where washout of mangroves is a concern, a plant anchor may be necessary. A popular plant anchoring technique is to use a candy cane shaped metal bar about three feet in length to pin the root ball into the soil. 
This provides extra support for the plantings, though it comes at an additional cost. Regardless of species, make sure that holes are totally filled in and planting units are snug in the ground. Air pockets left behind in holes will cause plants to tip or fall over and be less secure in the soil, hindering establishment. So now that we know what elevation and what depth to plant our plants, we also want to consider the spacing of the plants. Most coastal restoration projects plant marsh plants on two or three foot centers. However, if at all possible, it is ideal to plant more densely, even up to as dense as on one foot centers. Denser plantings will allow the marsh to establish more quickly and have a higher chance of success. Furthermore, research shows that adding multiple stems per hole can increase success rates. This is because the plants help support each other physically and chemically. If your budget allows, purchase larger planting units that have multiple stems, at least two to three stems for smooth cord grass and five to 10 stems for salt marsh hay. For mangroves, spacing recommendations range from two to eight foot centers, depending on the size of the tree installed. Generally, most practitioners aim for three foot centers if possible. As for marsh plantings, the denser the better for mangrove plantings. For both marshes and mangroves, planting rows are usually staggered, as shown, to provide the most efficient coverage of the planting zone. Plantings generally fare best when planted in the spring or summer, March to September in Florida, because during the active growing season, their roots can extend and become better anchored. An additional consideration in Florida is hurricane season. Given that this occurs over the summer, the most opportune time to install plants for living shorelines in Florida is the early spring, March to May. This gives the longest possible time before any potential hurricanes for plants to establish a better hold in the soil. This is especially true for mangroves. Installing plants in the fall or winter is acceptable, but just realize that they will be in a more dormant state and will not begin to expand or self-anchor very much until the spring. In the case that you cannot avoid planting in the fall or winter, opt to plant more densely and consider irrigating high marsh and upland areas if needed to help them stay alive over the dry season. Beyond season, another timing consideration is the tide. Logistically, it is easier to install plants during low tide. Try to time your planting event to occur within one to two hours before or after peak low tide, especially for the low marsh planting zone. Predictions for tide timing and height are available from various apps and online sources through the system of NOAA tide stations. Another important factor that can impact the success of your plantings is the condition of the plants. Make sure that you are using healthy, native plants with established, actively growing roots to ensure planting success. Generally, the largest planting unit that you can afford for the project would be the best choice. Larger plants are less vulnerable and more likely to establish, but do tend to be more expensive. Select the optimal trade-off based on budgetary constraints that allows you to buy the highest total number of plants that are also the largest possible size. It is possible to grow most salt marsh and mangrove species in fresh water, and for simplicity's sake, many commercial nurseries do so. Therefore, most plants need to be conditioned for salt exposure prior to planting at the site. Red mangroves can exclude salt from their tissues, so they can be taken directly from a freshwater environment to a saltwater one with minimal stress. However, other species of mangrove and most marsh grasses, especially smooth cord grass, need to be acclimated to a saltwater environment if they were reared in a freshwater nursery. If you are buying plants from a nursery, work with them to ensure the plants are acclimated to at least 10 to 15 parts per thousand before they are planted. If you will be acclimating the plants yourself, step up the salinity gradually, increasing salt content of the nursery water by about 5 parts per thousand each week. There are many commercially available products for creating artificial seawater if you do not have access to a natural source of seawater.
Before we wrap up, let's just cover a few final considerations. The first is temporary stabilization. In moderate to low energy sites, you may want to install a living shoreline that is vegetation based and does not include a reef breakwater. In these cases, consider temporary stabilization of plantings using a biodegradable substrate such as core logs. These logs are made of natural fibers that break down over time, but can add a layer of protection to plants during the most vulnerable time before they are established. Another consideration is hybrid shorelines involving seawalls. Sometimes you may face a situation where a property owner wants to add an enhancement to an existing seawall or bulkhead. This so-called hybrid shoreline is not a true living shoreline because the seawall still creates many unnatural conditions. However, any enhancement of vegetation or other habitat in front of a seawall is a great thing for the environment and neighboring shorelines and will help enhance the longevity of the seawall at the same time. There are many options for enhancing vegetation in front of a seawall, and the same considerations we already covered, such as elevation, still apply. There are also many newer options coming onto the market to help improve seawalls' environmental functions. These include panels that you can affix to the face of the wall that mimic mangrove roots, various types of planter boxes that can be installed on an existing seawall, and also eco-friendly riprap with built-in tide pools and planter modules. Finally, it bears mentioning that many of these techniques are applicable in freshwater areas using different sets of plant species and environmental indicators. For more information on addressing erosion and habitat loss in freshwater ponds, lakes, and stream banks, the USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service is a great place to start. Thank you for watching and good luck with your living shoreline. Let us know in the comments if this video was helpful and be sure to check out the companion video that covers information about installing oyster reef breakwaters. If you need help with living shorelines in your neighborhood, experts with UF IFAS Extension and Florida Sea Grant are only a call or email away. You can find contact information for knowledgeable professionals near you at floridalivingshorelines.com slash contacts. <laughs>